Gentlemen, my guest today is Mr. Scott Ritter. Mr. Ritter, today I have one, one global question for you that worries many Russian people. President Putin announced partial mobilization today. Many people in oh, Russia Russ literally <laughs> by this information. I think we can say that people are panicking. Uh, his interesting message uh, for you in telegrams, I read that many men are going to leave Russia for Georgia, for Turkey and other places. Uh, it is also an interesting fact that the prices of flight uh, to Istanbul uh, and Tbilisi, for example, have increased several times in a couple of hours, literally. I have a very long question for you today. I will ask them all at once and just listen to you. The first part of my question. What do you think about its mean? Why this is mobilization and not uh, recruitment for volunteers? Does this mobilization mean that what we uh, told in Russia about the affairs in Ukraine was uh, maybe a liar and everything is really very bad? And what uh, do you think is this part of not only the war with Ukraine, but also preparation for the war with NATO? And the second part of my question is my personal question. Um, I served in the Russian army as a conscript for one year in Kaliningrad. I cannot say that I am directly ready for the army and for the war. For example, who a uh, uh, year I have never fired a machine gun, never fired. My parents and sister are also in a panic. Uh, they advise me to go to Kazakhstan, my historical homeland. But I don't know intent to break the law and if I necessary, I am ready to try to help my country. But I have a uh, kind of sins. Uh, uh, since the army of my country, such crooked army has failed in Ukraine for more than six months, they they probably only need my help. For this, uh, for me, this is maybe journey. And when I hope I will the opportunity to write books about it, like Eric Marie remark, maybe. I don't know. This is stupid thinking, uh, but yet, but still, but. I don't have any skills. And what advice you give to men like me? What is the best way to prepare to possible mobilization? How to set yourself up psychologically? What do you read for? Please answer this. Well, let me start off by saying that I'm an American. I'm not a Russian. So I'm in no position to pass advice to any Russian about the fares of Russia. I'll start with this, though. Um, Russia did not start this war. This is a war that was started by NATO. This is a war that has been ongoing against Russia for decades. The West has been trying to destroy Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So if you're a Russian, understand this, your nation is in danger. Your nation is in danger. Your nation is in more danger than it has ever been since the end of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. This is an existential problem for Russia. The West is trying to destroy you. So you, you have to keep that in mind. This isn't about Vladimir Putin waking up one morning and deciding on a whim, oh, I'm going to invade Ukraine so that I can be the man who restored Novoya Russia to the Russian Federation. I can be the man that resurrected the Soviet Union. This is not the case at all. If you study the history of this conflict, you'll know that Russia has been assiduous in respecting the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine from the very beginning of Ukrainian independence. Vladimir Putin has given several speeches, one on February 21st, one on February 24th, 
where he articulated his historic understanding of the relationship between the Russian Federation and the Russian nation. And it's two different things. I shouldn't have to explain this to a Russian. Um, you know, it's, it's two different things. But he has said Ukraine is a sovereign state. And that, for instance, when the uh, Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic, formerly Donetsk Oblast and Lugansk Oblast, declared independence in 2014, Russia said, no, we will not recognize you because you are part of Ukraine. But Russia has an obligation to the Russian nation, meaning those Russian ethnic people and the people who speak Russian, the people who have historical, cultural, and religious ties to Russia, to protect their rights. And so Russia made a decision that it would support the defense of the so-called separatists, but would pursue a peace agreement uh, that provided security for the, the Russian speakers, but res respected the integrity of Ukraine. So this is not a war of Russian aggression. This is a war brought on by NATO through NATO expansion and a continuation of policies that have been in place since 1992 to dismember Russia. There are some people who believe that if Russia, if, Vlad, if um, Vladimir Putin did not become president and Boris Yeltsin had continued for another three years, that Russia would not exist today. I support that. Russia exists today only because of the leadership provided by Vladimir Putin. I'm not saying he's perfect. I'm not saying that there could have been different decisions made. I'm stating a simple fact. Russia exists today only because of the leadership provided by Vladimir Putin. Love him or hate him. That's a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. Now we look at what's going on. What did Vladimir Putin promise when he went into Ukraine? First of all, he didn't go into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. He promised to defend the Donbass. He promised to defend the republics the, 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 of, of Lugansk and Donetsk. That was his promise. I will defend them. I will restore their territorial integrity. Ukraine no longer has a right to govern over them because Ukraine has shown itself un, unable or unwilling to respect the rights of Russians. So that was the purpose. He also said in order to protect the Donbass and to protect Russia, that he needs to demilitarize Ukraine, that is to get rid of the NATO weaponry that had been provided to Ukraine. Um, and he needed to denazify the Ukrainian government, which since May, uh, since February of 2014, has been under the sway of a neo-Nazi ideology that dates back to Stepan Bandera. Again, I don't have to explain this history to the, to the Russian people, or I shouldn't have to explain it to them. Mm -hmm. But let's keep this in mind, because when I hear people say, that they were lied to by the Russian government. There was no lies. What lie? What lie has the Russian government said? Oh, we were told we were going to win. You are winning. You are winning. One only has to take a look at the casualties that have occurred on the battlefield to understand that the Russian army is winning this fight. But this is no longer a fight between Russia and Ukraine. That was the special military operation. This is a fight between Russia and NATO, Russia and the European Union, Russia and the United States. That's a different geopolitical reality mm -hmm. than existed in February 24th. And because of this, Russia does not have the resources allocated to the special military operation capable of achieving the objectives that were promised. This isn't about Russia losing. This is about the nature of the game changing. Back in May, when mm -hmm. the United States passed the Lend-Lease Act, I clearly stated that this was a game changing event, that you cannot inject tens of billions of dollars of military assistance into Ukraine and provide Ukraine strategic depth in terms of access to bases in Germany and France and England and Poland and elsewhere without altering the military balance, and that Russia would have to respond. After the Kharkov offense of um, earlier this month, I said that this is proof that the Ukrainian army stopped being an army of Ukrainians trained and equipped by NATO, 
and had become a NATO army manned primarily by Ukrainians. But that's a qualitative difference. And that Russia would need to radically alter its approach to the special military operation if it were to prevail. What you're seeing right now is that radical alteration. Two things about it. One, the um, partial mobilization, 300,000 men. I think everybody in, in Russia should understand that this is not the end game. It could be the end game, but Russia has 25 million trained personnel in the reserves that can be mobilized. They don't see the need right now, but should NATO continue to escalate, then Russia would have to match that escalation. So this may not be the last mobilization. Does that mean that Russia is losing, that the Russian people have been lied to? Absolutely not. It means that NATO is expanding the threat it poses to Russia, that Russia must respond. Right now, Russia is seeking only those forces necessary to enable them to accumulate the combat power needed to defeat the new NATO army operating in Ukraine. Um, we'll see if it's sufficient or not. There's another thing going on too. Russia initially only intended to uh, liberate Donbas. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not. I think Russia also intended to liberate Kherson and Russia intended to liberate Zaporizhia and create a land bridge. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying the Russian government's lying, but it's clear that Donbas in isolation uh, only weakened Crimea, that Russia has to respect the fact that Ukraine threatens Crimea and that part of this operation, the special military operation, isn't just the liberation of Donbass, but the protection of Crimea. That means that you must extend the Crimea presence into the Ukrainian hinterland through Kherson and then up through Zaporizhia and into the Donbass. Um, and this is what Russia did early on. Um, what, what, does, what does this mean? Now, the Russians come in and do this. The, the population there takes a look at the Russian soldier and says, are you here temporarily or are you here permanently? Because right now, the government in Kiev is threatening to kill me as a collaborator. Mm -hmm. And we know what the government in Kiev has done. We know it through Bucha. We know what happened to Bucha. Mm -hmm. This was not the Russians killing place. This was the Ukrainian services hunting down and killing those civilians they accused of collaborating with Russia. Clear statement of fact. We now see in Kharkov what's happening. The Kraken Italian running around and executing people accused of collaboration. Um, so I think people are afraid. Is Russia serious? Is this something that Russia is going to see through or am I putting my life and the life of my family at risk? So there's going to be a referendum. And the referendum is going to give the population a chance to articulate, uh, in accordance with international law, their desires. Do they want to stay a part of Ukraine? Do they want to be independent? Or do they want to be a part of the Russian Federation? And the feeling is that they're going to vote for being a part of the Russian Federation. And this is then becomes, it changes the equation altogether because it's no longer a special military operation. What happens is it is the defense of the Russian homeland, the defense of the Russian fatherland. And that is a radical departure from the special military operation. Now, any attack made against Kherson, any mm -hmm. attack made against Donetsk becomes an attack against Russia, and Russia will respond in kind. Russia has to be prepared for that, which is why you have partial mobilization. So I don't, you know, when, when President Putin spoke, and when Marshal Shoigu spoke, I looked at them carefully. There wasn't any panic, no panic. There's firmness, decisiveness, uh, but no panic. So anybody who thinks that Russia is losing, that they've been lied to by their government, no, you haven't been lied to. Russia is not losing, but Russia can't win unless they match the changes to the reality brought on by NATO's provision of billions of dollars of military assistance to Ukraine. Russia much match this and provide a qualitative increase in its own combat capability. Now, for you, mm -hmm. my understanding, and this is the, the statements coming from Russian officials, that anybody who is called up as part of this special military operation, first of all, you're going to be a contract soldier. You're not a conscript. 
You're going to sign a contract. But you are not going to be a frontline combatant. Russia understands that you're not you're not a killer. <laughs> you're not a frontline. You might have to kill. You might have to defend yourself. But that anybody called up will be called up to defend the borders of Russia and to provide strategic depth in the uh, what's called right now the Special Military Operation Theater of Operations, but what may become the Loyal Rossiya. Um, and the, the depth allows the troops that are currently doing this, who are killers, the paratroopers, the Marines, mm-hmm. the frontline soldiers, who should be on the front line fighting this NATO army, but instead they're providing rear security. It frees mm-hmm. them now to go to the front to do their job. So for, for people panicking, first of all, war is no game. There's no guarantee of anything. You join, mm-hmm. you join the military, you sign that contract, and you're providing rear area security, it doesn't make you immune to Ukrainian artillery fire. Artillery shells can come down, they can kill you, they can maim you, they can wound you. That's a reality. Um, It's war. But the concept that you're going to be thrown into battle, even though you have never fired a gun, even though you're not, you, you you probably haven't used a bayonet against a dummy, you probably haven't done any of that, and the, the fear might be, oh, my God, they're going to put me in uniform and send me to the front. No, that's not the case at all. You will be providing strategic depth. It's a valuable role. It's a role that empowers Russia by allowing them to take the very hard, tough, ready to combat ready troops and focus them solely on the job of completing the mission, completing the battle. Uh, so that's the role. Now, what would, what would I advise people? Again, I can't advise, but let me just give you my perspective. Um, in Vietnam, we had many Americans who decided they didn't want to get drafted. They didn't want to go to Vietnam. And many of these people chose to flee to Canada instead, or flee to Mexico, or flee to some other country. Um, and that's a very difficult thing for me, because I have relatives who fought in Vietnam, who made the decision to go to Vietnam. Uh, some who were wounded in Vietnam. Fortunately, I didn't lose any relatives killed in Vietnam, but many people died in Vietnam. And so on the one hand, and let me start by saying Vietnam was a horrible war and we shouldn't have been there. It's not a glorious patriotic fight. It was a duty, a responsibility to serve your country. Um, So on the one hand, I'm inclined not to look favorably upon people who flee. Um, But in retrospect, they voted their consciousness. They didn't agree with this war. They didn't uh, agree with the, the notion of being compelled to go to Vietnam and kill Vietnamese who were no threat to them. Um, and, and so in the long term, I've come to respect the courage of their decision. It was a courageous decision, a very difficult decision, and they paid a heavy price. So now we come to the present day in Russia. If this was, if the Ukraine operation was a war of aggression, where Russia was mercilessly invading Ukraine on the whim of a dictatorial president who was seeking to glorify his legacy, mm-hmm. I might say, vote your conscience. If you disagree with this conflict and you don't want to be called up, maybe courage requires you to leave rather than mean doing something that you shouldn't, you don't believe in. And, and, and this is tough because who here believes in war? Not a sane person believes in war. A sane person believes in peace. A logical person runs away from gunfire, not towards gunfire. Um, mm-hmm. But we live in a world where insanity reigns and illogic dominates. Um, NATO poses a threat to the Russian homeland. Russia is at risk. If NATO succeeds, Russia will be destroyed. And I'm not talking about nuclear holocaust. I'm talking about economically destroyed, politically destroyed. It will not be Russia. It will be a slave nation to the West, where the West exploits Russia for its resources, exploits Russian um, civilians for their labor potential, um, but doesn't respect Russia, doesn't respect the history of Russia, the culture of Russia, the language of Russia, anything about the Russian nation. Uh, Russia just becomes a colony of the West. That's the destruction of Russia. That's the goal and objective of NATO as we speak. 
Therefore, I say it's a duty and responsibility of every able-bodied Russian male to step up and defend their homeland. That's my position. People can disagree with me. Nobody should view this. I don't say this as, you know, glory. There is no glory in war. You either die or you survive. There's no glory. Some people are put in extraordinary circumstances where they're recognized for heroism. What is heroism? Heroism means you got lucky. Heroism means you were placed under extreme stress where a lot of people died. A bullet just didn't happen to hit you in the head or the heart. Heroism means you did your duty, but you were scared to death doing it. Anybody who says, I wasn't afraid, I don't believe them. You were scared, you were nervous, um, and you got lucky enough to live. And as a result, people call you a hero. But you're not a hero. You're a survivor. You're a survivor. The heroic act is stepping forward and saying, I'm here. Count me in. I will serve my country. That's the act of heroism. What happens after that? It's just a matter of the roll of the dice, man. You don't know. You can be the bravest person in the world and the first bullet out hits you in the head and you're dead. You can be the biggest coward in the world and every bullet misses you. You just don't know what's going to happen in war. But I would say that it is the duty of every able-bodied Russian male to make himself available. Only a partial mobilization at this point in time. There is no intention of putting people on the front line. That's the statement of the Russian government. But, you know, being made available to do a support job frees up somebody to fight on the front line. And that's as important as anything else. Mm-hmm. It would be a horrible idea to put you on the front line. It would actually make Russia weaker to put you on the front line. I'm not picking on you, but by your own admission, you don't know how to fight. So why would I put you on the front line? That just pretty much guarantees you're going to die. But if I put you in a different position, one that maybe matches your skill set, you get to go and you get to do that. You free up somebody who knows how to shoot, who knows how to do tactics, who is trained to do that. You free him up to do the job he was trained to do. And that's a smart use of manpower. So... I, I, I think those Russians who are fleeing right now in five years will be ashamed of their actions, will view what they did shamefully, and will regret this decision. Because in five years, it will become obvious the threat that was posed to Russia. Maybe right now you can't see it. Maybe you're blind to the realities. Maybe life is too complicated. You don't have access to information or uh, whatever. But in five years, when this war is finished, and Russia has won, and the histories are being written about the importance of this action, those people who fled, I believe, will regret it. And they won't regret it just individually. Their nation will look on them with shame, and rightfully so. You ran away at the moment your nation needs you, the moment of greatest need right now, right here, this time, this place. Um, So that's my answer. And again, I offer that as an American yeah. Far removed from the problem. I don't pretend that I know anything more than any Russian. You asked me my opinion, so I offered my opinion. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, with this interview, you calmed uh, down and gave uh, understanding of many, many thousands of people all over Russia. And we appreciate and uh, grateful for your work. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you very much. Don't...